Um, uh, namaste everyone. Um, I'm Ashay Naik and uh, thanks for joining me on this uh, Indic chat. Uh, today's session will be on uh, ancient Indian political thought as contained in the Panchatantra and how the text explains uh, political thought through the medium of stories. Uh, I am uh, thankful to uh, uh, Indic um, Book Club for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic as well as the uh, sponsors, the, uh, the media partners, um, uh, Creative India Magazine and uh, Swarajya Magazine for uh, promoting this event. So uh, the plan for uh, this session is uh, as follows. Uh, firstly, I will do an invocation to the deities and the teachers and to Vishnu Sharma and the Panchatantra on which I have written my commentary called the Natural Animity. Uh, secondly, I will discuss some of the um, general themes uh, relating to political thought which occur in the Panchatantra. Uh, after that, uh, we will delve into some of the the stories. I have about four stories planned, but we will see how uh, uh, we go with time, and uh, we will we will have a closer look as to how what kind of niti is taught in these stories, and uh, how through the uh, through the through by uh, developing uh, by by facilitating uh, uh, the development of uh, an empathy with its characters and the, the production of rasa uh, the. Panchatandra communicates its message. Um, after that, I can I can take on uh, some of the questions and then we can wind up. Um, the main takeaway that I would like uh, like you to have from uh, from this particular session is that uh, firstly I, I would like um, to improve the, the the appreciation of Panchatandra. Uh, among the in the Indian community in particular and the world at large, which is uh, that unfortunately the Panchatantra has come to be regarded as a collection of uh, children's fables, but it is far from that. Uh, it is um, uh, it, it has it's a serious text. It discusses very serious political thought uh, in the form of stories, and the stories are not just you know something uh, interesting that is given to you because uh, political thought is a very dry subject and so on. No, uh, the stories are actually case studies and they model the kind of political challenges the, the readers, at least the readers in the time of the Panchatantra, were likely to confront in their world and uh, man, much of that is still relevant even today as uh, the stories will show. So, uh, so, so, so a better appreciation of the Panchatantra is one thing that I would like uh, all of you to uh, to uh, take away from this session. And the other thing is, uh, you know, I mean, Independence Day was was just around the corner, and um, um, uh, it's a celebration of all things Indian, uh, at least in this week. And so, uh, one of the things that makes me feel very proud as an Indian uh, is uh, a book like the Panchatantra, and uh, it's really a privilege to be born in a culture that has produced a text like this and to to go to the world and say that you know I come from a land that can create that that has produced uh, texts of such great uh, literary value and I, I hope that at the end of the session that that you know you would be uh, you would be feeling the same as well with regards to the to the Panchatantra so that that's really my objective in in, in holding this uh, in joining this session and uh, I, I, as I said, I'm really grateful to Indic Chat for having given me this uh, opportunity. So, uh, without much ado, let, let's start. Let's get started, and um, I will. I will, as I said, I will start with uh, an invocation to the to the deities um, and uh, the gurus. Okay, so uh, Om Namaha Shri Sharada Ganapati Guru Bhya Mahakavi Bhyo Namaha. Brahma Rudra Kumaro Hari Varuna Yama Vannirindra Kuberash Chandra Ditya Saraswati Udadhi Yuga Naga Vayururvi Bhujanga Siddha Nadyo Shri Naushrir Diti Raditi Suta 
मातरश्चंडिकाद्या वेदास्तीर्था गणवसु मुनय पात नित्यम ग्रहाश्च मनवे वाचस्पत शुक्राय पराशराय ससुताय चाणक्याय च विदुषे नमोस्त नय शास्त्रकर्तृभ्य सकलाशास्त्र सारम जगति सलोक्य विष्णु शर्मेद तंत्र पंचबिरेत चकार सु मनोहर शास्त्र नमो नम सो विद इनवेशन ऑफ ऑफ द डेटीज एंड टू टू द गुरुज मनु एंड वाचस्पति एंड सो ऑन एंड टू विष्णु शर्मा एंड द बुक पंचतंत्र विच ही हैज रिटन विच इन आई मीन दिस इनवेशन इज एट द स्टार्ट ऑफ हिज बुक्स आई थॉट आई डिसाइड एट द बिगिनिंग ऑफ दिस दिस सेशन um with that i will just give a brief introduction of myself and the book natural enmity which i have written as a commentary on the first tantra of the panchatantra um so uh, i mean as i said my name is ashay naik i uh, work as a software engineer in sydney australia uh, but i have always been very deeply interested in sanskrit and uh, indic thought so uh, a few years back i completed my honors in sanskrit from the university of sydney and in the course of that study i i uh, came across the panchatantra as well i mean uh, the, the sanskrit texts of the panchatantra as well as uh, the western interpretations uh, by uh, some scholars uh, who uh, sort of interpreted it as saying that the tech the stories are about social oppression and uh, or about political immorality so i uh, my I, i wrote my honors thesis in trying to rebut Uh, these uh, misrepresentations uh, of the panchatantra but in the course of it i also realized that uh, the panchatantra deserves a full fledged commentary of its own which can really do justice to the kind of thought that is contained in it and um, i was i was inspired in writing this commentary by uh, works you know like like uh, adi shankar acharya's commentary on the bhagavad gita or medhatithi's commentary on the manusmriti i mean in these commentaries these ancient commentators you know they take us through the text step by step and uh, allow you to sort of really immerse in the text you know instead of just writing analytical essays that tell you oh, this is what the gita teaches or that is what manuspriti teaches uh, a commentarial form really allows you to you know engage very deeply with the text and uh, that's what i really wanted to to uh, to do for the panchatantra and that's why i thought i should write a commentary and um, so the first uh, step of it was this book natural enmity um, which um, is, is a commentary on the first tantra that is the separation of friends or mitra bheda uh, that's about 50% of the book and the other other tantras are comparatively smaller now uh, the strategy that i employed in in writing this commentary was um, what what gadimir has called uh, closing the hermeneutic circle between the reader and the text uh, what that means is uh, uh, an interpretation should um, take the reader into the world of the text uh, explain the text from its uh, own point of view because uh, i mean the panchatantra was written in a very different kind of world from our own uh, that world i see as characterized by uh, social hierarchy political despotism kinship communities or jatis that's how people were living and uh, i see the panchatantra as sort of trying to understand the problems of that world and trying to solve those problems in 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 its own way whatever it thought would be good in order that the system whatever is there is not oppressive to people so that's what i mean by taking the reader into the text of the world um at the same time we also need to bring the text into our world and see what the text can tell us about uh, the problems that we face in our world so uh, our world i see i, I see has been characterized by uh, goals like social equality political de- uh, liberty uh, universal brotherhood i mean this is this is radically different i think from anything that the panchatantra would have known but then if you have a text which is you know really plums the depths of human nature and um 
really tries to understand things in a very fundamental way as the Panchatantra does, then uh, it can give us insights even in in uh, in our world. And I think uh, uh, you would be persuaded uh, of this statement when I when I take you through some of the the stories. Okay. So, but let me before I come to the stories, I just want to highlight certain uh, important themes. Uh, in the Panchatantra in general, okay, what, what is the Panchatantra about? So um, one of the first themes that to cover is the importance of wealth. Uh, so usually we think of Indian thought as, you know, consisting mostly of Vedanta and Advaita and, and you know, Parabrahma and all that sort of stuff. And I think we don't really pay a lot of attention to the Vyavaharic text, that is text that teaches how to actually work in Vyavahar and how to conduct Vyavahar, basically. And uh, that's what, uh, you know, the, that's what the Arthashastra uh, tradition is about and, uh, and the Panchatantra is basically located in that. So right at the beginning of the Panchatantra, you have the model, you have the, uh, 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 the, the model in, uh, in the form of Vardhamana, who is like, who is the Artharthi, like he's a businessman, he's born rich, but he realizes the importance of wealth and uh, he tries to undertake a, uh, take a business to, uh, to, to increase his wealth. So that is one of the points that the Panchatantra makes. And there's a very nice verse on that, uh, which I can share with you, which is, um, uh, Arthaihi artha nibadhyante gajaihi iva maha gajaha nahi anarthavata shakyam vanijyam kartum ihaya. Now, I, I, the reason I'm sharing with you is because there's this wonderful metaphor here that wealth begets wealth, that is, use wealth to uh, earn wealth and the, the example that is given here is that of elephants uh, attracting elephants. So basically, um, if, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to catch an elephant, then usually like a female elephant or someone is used and then she attracts the, the male elephant and, and then the other elephant is caught. I mean, one of my friends shared this wisdom with me. And, um, and, and, and so this, this it, it starts off really like this, you know, this one of these rich dad, poor dad kind of stories, or we want to to be rich, you know, there's these kind of books that, that, that are available now that sort of emphasize prosperity and ask you, you know, uh, encourage you to increase your wealth and so on. And, and everything else, and everything that is worth achieving, like even dharma and so on, happens through wealth. So there's a lot of emphasis on wealth in, in, in the Panchatantra. And um, at the same time, I mean, if you look at the story of Vardhamana, he's not only industrious, he's not only taking risks to increase his wealth by, you know, traveling uh, abroad, like I mean, abroad in the sense from Kashmir to Mathura, but but that would have been a perilous undertaking in its time. And uh, he takes that risk so that, you know, uh, to increase his wealth. But, and he, he makes his his animals, his the bulls and so on, he employs work really hard. But at the same time, when the bull gets injured in the forest, he's very compassionate. He holds the, back the caravan, you know, uh, uh, for a few days and so on. So it's not only industry, but even compassion. And then and later on, when, when he's mistakenly told that the bull has died and so on, then he performs all the necessary rites for the posthumous welfare of the bull and so on. So basically industry and uh, compassion, you know, together uh, are presented to us in this in this model of uh, Vardhamana. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, usually, uh, generally sannyasis and monks, I mean, sannyasis and, and uh, ascetics monks and so on, are uh, sort of depicted as frauds in this in this book. And I, I think that there is probably a clash here between the grihastha and the sannyas ashram. There has always been a case of, you know, because the sannyasis are usually think that, oh, we are, you know, attaining moksha and all that. And that's the important stage and that's what's worth achieving. But then it is the grihastha, the grihasthas who uphold society, who uphold order in society and um, um, makes, uh, you know, uh, makes society possible and even sannyas ashram possible because they are dependent on begging and arms, you know, which the, the householder provides. And uh, therefore, I mean, you should... Uh, uh, sometimes, it, uh, you know, these kind of stuff, which usually you would hear from an Advaitin or a, or a Sannyasi or so on, uh, are uh, kind of used in a very negative way in the Panchatantra. So if I can just read you a small passage, you have a, you know, a very beautiful passage, which you would think is, 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 is very spiritual, like, uh, Asaro yam samsaraha, this samsar is asar, 
गिरी नदी वेगोपम यौवनम यूथ इज फ्लीटिंग तृणाग्नि समम जीवित लाइफ इज फ्रेजाइल अब्र छाया सदृशा भोगा और यू नो स्वप्न सदृश पुत्र मित्र भृत्य कलत्र वर्ग संबंध सो ऑल दीज संबंध वी हैव एंड रिलेशन एंड ऑल दैट इज ऑल जस्ट स्वप्न सदृश so but but who's saying these things really if you if you see the person who's saying this is actually a person who's trying to he he wants to become a disciple of a guru so that he can rob his monastery and he wants to get into the monastery but he's not able to get, he can't find any other way so he thinks okay i'll be a disciple of that and he says all these things and a lot of times you find these sort of platitude being being said and what the panchatantra is saying is that you know, just because of you hear a person saying all these things do not trust that he really means any of this you know these things are often said by people to try and uh, swindle their victims so the panchatantra is very uh, you know it's it's uh, it's, it's very um, um suspicious you might say of all these um, uh, of all those who take the monastic path and so on you know are, are these i mean is it really possible for uh, for human beings to be that um, you know to have that sort of vairagya bhava and so on so i mean we have it's not like it's impossible but you should be impo- you should be careful that nobody is deceiving you by you know taking on a vairagya bhava um and 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 then there's a very nice line uh, in in the first tantra itself uh, which says um, कह काल कानी मित्राणी को देशह को व्ययागम कश्चाहम काच मे शक्तिर इति चिन्त्य मुहुर मुहु द रीजन व्हाई आई ब्रिंग दिस अप इज बिकॉज़ इट रिमाइंडेड मी वेरी मच ऑफ यू नो द भज गोविंदम व्हिच वेज गोस लाइक कस्त्वम को हम कुता आयात एंड सो ऑन सो अ मोनास्टिक टेक्स्ट लाइक द भज गोविंदम यू नो इट 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 कीप्स काइंड ऑफ saying that you know realize the illusionness of the world ask yourself who are you really and and so on you know that's the sort of thing we will get in all the nivrutti texts or the moksha texts or vairagya texts and so on but in a vyavaharic text like the panchatantra uh, that actually asks us to think on political lines like you know kah kal what is the time kani mitrani who are your friends who are your allies who are your enemies who desh ho you know what is the place what are the customs where you are living kas chaham kaach me shakti hi what is your power you know what can you achieve in this world iti chintya muhur muhu these are the kind of things that you should you should uh, you should think of so so basically the panchatantra is a very worldly text it encourages worldliness uh, worldliness and um, and so that's what that's one of the major themes that we see throughout this this uh, this book and you know it encourages travel risk taking whatever is needed you know you, and just because you have a lot of wealth does not mean you should just sit quietly on it but use it for investment and for and and, and that includes i mean charity and uh, uh, building public amenities and all that expend it on worthy causes don't just just hoard it and so on uh the other uh, important principle that we uh, that we see here is uh, that of you know natural enmity and incidental enmity uh, natural enmity as i said is is the is the title i have taken for my book so uh, which which in in sanskrit is swabhava vair or uh, sahaja vair now uh, what does that uh, what does that mean is uh, what does it mean to say that you know we are we are swabhava vairis now this this there's actually a dialogue in the second tantra uh, where uh, you have a mouse and a, uh, and a crow and the crow wants to become friends with the mouse now the crow is the predator and the mouse is the prey and so the mouse tells the crow that you know you and i are swabhava vairis we are natural enemies of each other so how can friendship ever be possible between us now when we what what it means is that there are certain fundamental differences between human groups and they can never be overcome and it is very important to understand that the rivalry that we have is it natural or is it incidental if it is incidental rivalry then that can be solved by you know remedying whatever is the cause of it but natural enmity means that there are differences between human groups that that are so fundamental that they can never be resolved and therefore the, uh, natural enmity will only end when one or the other side is destroyed so for example you know if you take let's say the enmity or the, ri- the rivalry between india and pakistan i mean is it a natural enmity or is it an incidental enmity so if you say for example that oh you know the, the rivalry exists because of the kashmir problem or because of the water sharing problem then that's like saying it's an incidental enmity if we solve these problems our enmity will go away 
But on the other hand, if we say that you know, the, the enmity between Pakistan and India exists at a very fundamental level because Pakistan was born of the idea of a two nation theory and we reject it, then that is an example of natural enmity. I mean, then there is no way in which this enmity can be resolved. If the very foundation principle of, say, Pakistan is not acceptable to us, then there is nothing that can be done about it. Now, uh, you know, of the, or, or another quick example I can give you is that of, say, the Hindu Christian pro issue of, you know, proselytization. Now, Christians, for example, believe that, you know, Jesus, by his sacrifice, by his crucifixion, um, uh, paid for the sins of all human beings. Now, uh, Hindus, on the other hand, perform dharma to remove papa. Now, if you're saying on the one hand that, um, that that Jesus paid for the sins of all, then then that means no other uh, culture should be performing any dharma because he has paid for all the pap. Which means that every time you perform a dharma, you are basically saying that you're basically questioning the efficacy of Jesus' sacrifice. Which is why then the Christians have to go around proselytizing everyone. Because everyone has to stop their dharmas, right? And, and accept Jesus as their savior. Otherwise, the Christian doctrine is falsified. So, so see, these are the kind of problems that, that there is no solution for them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental contradiction and we just have to learn to live with it. Okay. So, however, you know, I think some people uh, somehow think that, okay, because of this idea of natural enmity, what the Panchatantra is saying is that, uh, you know, those who are natural enemies, enemies will perpetually be at war with each other. But that's not what the Panchatantra is saying. In fact, it is often missed that, that you know, ironically, this very passage that deals with natural enmity, that, that explains natural enmity, occurs in the second tantra where actually the predator and the prey become the best of friends. So it's not, so Panchatantra is not saying that because there is natural enmity, so friendship between such these parties is impossible. Rather, instead, what is what it is saying is that look how this friendship has, however, developed. You know, the, the friendship between the crow and the uh, and the mouse develops over a very long time. There is initially there is no trust between them. Both are aware of the contradictions of each other's, uh, the fears of each other, and so on. The crow promises that he will not step into the mouse's fort. Uh, the mouse does not want to come out and meet the crow, and then there is a lot of you know talking and, and, and gift giving and, and slowly that friendship really matures and both are conscious of the contradiction between them they don't kind of get oh we are friends now so we don't have to worry about the predator prey problem no the, that that those contradictions both of them are aware but they are both committed however to work around it and nonetheless make that friendship work which is why it works okay on the other hand um, if you take the, the first stories, okay, the first story also has a lot of these predator pay issues and natural enmity issues where you have many stories with the lion and the bull or the lion and the camel, uh, they become friends or the lion gives refuge to the, to, to these animals and, um, uh, but later on it breaks down. And the reason why it breaks down is often because that alliance, uh, is formed emotionally uh, they don't really think over what they are doing. They don't, you know, and, and which is why then it becomes very easy for someone to cause divisions and cause a clash between them. So the Panjshir is not saying that um, uh, that natural enmity is impossible. It's just saying that, sorry, that uh, friendship uh, 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 between natural enemies is impossible. It, it's just saying that you, re you really need to work for it and you will never be able to solve the internal contradictions or the potential for conflict will always remain and you better be aware of these things otherwise it will it will break down and because many of the cases in the panchatan in the first tantra actually show how how you know a friendship across uh, a friendship between natural enemies ultimately breaks down i thought that you know the first tantra is actually dealing with the natural enmity problem and that's why i have titled the book as um, as natural enmity uh, there are many more things to go. I'll probably just take one more uh, thing, uh, one more important point, which is uh, uh, two kind of political systems are shown in this book. Um, one is um, uh, the Samrajya and that is usually modeled with the lion and the jackal and the leopard and, and, and or what is called as the, what are known as the meat eaters are often shown. That kind of a government where the lion is the king and the are uh, of a different jati, uh, that is say the jackal or um, uh, the leopard, the crow and so on. 
uh, that is that is basically modeled uh, uh, as the samrajya and uh, on the other hand you also have the sangharajya where uh, the king is actually the first among equals and the king and his ministers always belong to the same jati so uh, 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 you you could have a monojati herd and it can be a herd of elephants a, a, a group of frogs uh, a troop of monkeys a troop of mice or whatever i mean you know wherever you see uh, stories in which you generally have a chieftain and his followers are of the same jati then then that is usually a model of the a metaphor for the sangharajya and i think uh, although most of the stories in the first tantra deal with the uh, samrajya issues like you know uh, the government is of the king and uh, the and, and the ministers who is usually the jackal and so on and then an outsider usually comes into this circle who has a different point of view who is almost like a personage or a civilian sometimes it's the bull sometimes it's the it's a camel and and then once he gets into the the government and all sorts of problems occur and how the king has to balance between these two personalities so the, the, i think that would have been a, quite a problem in ancient india and 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 uh, and the samrajya uh, stories actually deal with that kind of kind of problem that is how can the king balance between between the government whose task is danda and so on and the uh, or sometimes war and aggression and and military pursuits in general uh, and then you have the outsider who is the civilian who is you know interested more in arts and uh, and uh, altruism and those kind of pursuits uh, but i think al although like many of the stories in the first tantra are about the samrajya i think uh, the panchatantra has a soft corner for the sangharajya uh, i think the, the the chief of the sangharajya is always um, shown in a much better uh, way than um, then the then the samrajya and and usually you see uh, the sangharajya the 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 chief of the samrajya is usually the lion the lion is usually a metaphor for the king uh, of the samrajya and uh, or the samrat and the elephant is the is the general metaphor for the for the chief of the sangharajya because he is the yuthapati he is the model yuthapati so the elephant is usually used for that and i think i think one of the reasons why perhaps ganesh or ganpati has an elephant head is 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 i think because because the elephant is usually seen is the model for this chief of the sangha uh, political establishment and 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 again you see that um, uh, the elephant and the uh, the lion are often seen as natural enemies so in all these stories the lion is always fighting with the elephant and he gets crippled so uh, i i think uh, in in sort of trying to say that you know um, these are natural enemies and the, the so the monarchy always wants to obliterate the sangha rajya and uh, but it gets uh, it, it 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 is hard and, it, and and often the lion gets crippled in all his wars with the with the elephant i mean that's a very common motif across these stories but but if you see the reality then we know that it is the it is the uh, the samrajyas which ultimately uh, destroyed the sangharajyas you know with magadha finally appearing emerging as the supreme samrajya so i think that much of the samrajya um, uh samrajya um, sangharajya um, uh, ideas are, are can be can be seen through these through these stories um i i think we have we were almost half time i had some couple of other things to say but i, I think i'll, I'll maybe I'll, i'll get into a couple of stories as i said because i think that's more important so uh one of the stories that i want to start off with is is uh, and and that in, uh, that that will show you the samrajya politics uh is the camel and the lions retainers so i i won't go into the, the so the, so the first tantra basically consists of a main story which is the separation of friends and there are about 30 sub narratives in that so i will uh, one of those sub narratives is this camel and the lions retainers and i will i will just explain how that story story works so um those of you who may not be aware i'll quickly summarize it uh you have a camel who wanders into a forest uh in that forest there is a lion and he has three retainers uh, or three ministers uh, uh the the jackal uh, a crow and a leopard and they come across this lion you know they've never seen so they came across this camel they have never seen a camel before uh but but they but the lion is impressed with him in some way and he says he gives him refuge he offers him protection he says you can you can wander in the forest freely without any fear 
so the so the camel lives with them and uh, he sees like at the symbol of a for me I, i think he's more a symbol like a migrant community coming to uh, coming to a uh, you know uh, to a to a kingdom and they are given refuge and they said okay you can live here and you can follow your custom whatever it is so uh, i think that's what that story sort of symbolizes now as i said well the cam- the lion gets into a battle with the with an elephant and he's crippled and he can't hunt anymore so starvation then hits the king hence hits hits their uh, their government you know they, they, there is no food but uh, these three retainers nonetheless are very ro- loyal and they stay with the with the king and so the king so the lion then says that well let's go and look some look for some food and so that we can we can you know continue but and then they try to look for any fo- for for food in the forest but there is nothing there is a famine at the same time and so uh, there is no food available either and finally the lion is about to die and the jackal says that look i think things are now getting serious and uh, why are we you know bothering about this food and things so much when we have the camel i mean the camel is our natural food we should be killing the camel and and eating him and he says this he tells this to the to the lion and the lion is 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 enraged i mean say how can i do that i mean it's you know that would i have given him my word of protection i i can't deceive him in this way i mean i, I cannot kill him like this and it would be it would be beneath me it would be contemptible to to commit such an act so what the jackal does is he he kind of gathers all the other retainers together along along with the camel and he says that look the lion is about to die he is the master he is a swami we are his bhrutyas we are you know uh, we are his servants he has protected us he has nourished us for so long uh, we should be you know how we cannot let him die like this we should sacrifice ourselves for him we should offer ourselves as food to him and they they all agree that yeah we should do that and so the crow comes first and volunteers that look you know uh, kill me and eat me and and you know save yourself and of course the lion rejects that sacrifice and then the leopard also tries it and the jackal tries it and says you know eat me and and so on and then the camel is now sort of feeling that oh you know everyone is offering themselves as food and the lion is rejecting so maybe i should be doing this as well you know it would not be good if i if i just sort of not do this and so he also offers himself as uh, and says you know you can eat me and and save yourself uh, assuming that the lion would not would reject him as well but uh, as it happens you know the lion obviously says he gives his assent and then these other animals they pounce upon him and kill him so that's basically the story but but what 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 uh, is the story telling us so on the face of it it looks like you know the camel was deceived by all these other uh, other animals and if you look at the prefatory verse like all these stories start off with a verse even that says the same thing that you know like if you get into a, a group of mischievous people who are cheats and so on that they will um, trick you into uh, you know incurring some loss yourself like they might not actually do any uh, thing to you directly but they will um, uh, sort of shape your thinking in such a way that you will voluntarily commit you know do some damage to yourself and so you have to be very careful uh, in the company of these people that is the um, uh, the the overt moral of the story that, that that's the superficial view but but if you look at it deeper then what you realize is that uh, you know uh, is the camel really the tragic hero and uh, the the jackal is he really the villain because what you see is is when the uh, when the lion gets crippled and is not able to hunt and so on and is is suffering from starvation you know these are the the three meat eaters are the ones who are really affected by that and they remain loyal to him through all these problems so um uh, you know they have kind of proved their loyalty and in fact the jackal tells the lion that look uh, if you die then you know we have no choice but to follow you in the fire like you know we 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 will we will burn ourselves with you on the pyre i mean you know because we are your loyal servants so you know these these three animals they have truly i think proved their loyalty to the king but look at the camel i mean he is not affected by the problem he is merely eating uh, you know because he is he is a grass eater so he doesn't really have a problem with what the lion what is what is what has happened to the lion and in fact when these animals are all offering themselves as sacrifices i mean he is the one who is really deceiving because he doesn't intend to offer himself as a sacrifice i mean sure even the other animals are not intending it and i mean they know that that the lion cannot eat them like they are not the natural food of the lion but the thing is 
what becomes evident, what what is clear from the story is that if there was any way in which they could uh, kill, you know, if, if they would have to kill themselves to save the lion, they would do it. We see this loyalty in them. On the other hand, the the camel does not want to sacrifice himself. He's he is only saying that with the view that his sacrifice will be rejected. And so, I mean, this is how these Panchatantra stories work. They're very deceptive. So on the one hand, you know, the Panchatantra is, is saying that, you know, oh, there is all this deception going on in the world. And it, it shows these stories and explains how uh, the deception works in this world. But at the same time, I think the author is also trying to deceive the readers in some way by, uh, you know, by saying one thing. But actually, when you read through the story, something else becomes apparent through deeper reflection and uh, if you have to understand this story in the context of, uh, of of the real world for example then as i said i mean the 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 camel is like uh, the symbol uh, for, or the metaphor for the migrant community right like let's say a migrant community comes and settles in the kingdom now what if if uh, so the kingdom has protected them the i mean the king has has looked up to their security maybe he's given some concession to them and so on now if a calamity strikes the kingdom what is the role of this migrant community? Should they not be parting with some of their wealth and so on to save the kingdom? Now, what becomes apparent in this story is that here you have a migrant community who is not willing to help out. And then the question is, uh, should we deceive, should, is it then proper for the government to deceive them in some way or you know, to extract the wealth from them? Because that is something that they should have done. As, like as I said, I mean, the, sure the lion was, so sure the camel was deceived, but what was he deceived into doing? He was deceived into doing his own duty. I mean, this is what he should have done anyway. You know, he did not have to be deceived into doing this. So, uh, so these are the kind of issues that that come to the fore. And and what we see is that you see the jackal. He he's a very ordinary kind of a person. Like like he doesn't have a problem with the camel. It's not like. When the camel joins the circle, he says, "Ah, oh, yeah, okay, our food has come now. Let's let's eat him." Uh, that's not what he says. I mean, he's he's happy to have the camel. He he does nothing to disturb the camel and so on, because as long as the kingdom is is fine, you know, he has no problem, uh, or like the minister has no problem with the migrant community. But when the it is only when uh, when the when the kingdom is on the verge of bankruptcy or when the king is about to or in this case the lion is about to die, that's when he says, "Well, look, there are these rich people, this rich group who we have, you know, allowed to flourish in our land. Should we not now, you know, get them to sort of contribute to this problem?" Now, that's how the 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 jackal is thinking. Whereas you know the lion is. Um, uh, his situation is a bit different. Like he's a very honorable person, and he is in fact ready to die. Okay, he's not saying that. I mean, even when the when the uh, uh, when the uh, jackal comes to him and says that, oh, we can kill the lion. He, he uh, sorry, kill the camel. He's not happy with that solution. Uh, so he's a man of honor. He is. Uh, he's willing to say that. Uh, he he's ready to die rather than rather than kill the uh, camel and save himself. But what the thing is the. Uh, the jackal, because of his deception, it makes it very difficult for him to keep his honor. I mean, as long as you know, he had if he had to kill the camel, he you know he he stopped himself from doing that. But when the camel was deceived into offering himself uh, before the um, before the, um, the, the 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 lion, then. It, it became to, it became a temptation too difficult for him to resist, and and so even though he agreed that okay let the camel be killed, we see that he does not kill the camel himself. Now this is something very different because usually the the lion, uh, you know, the the paradigm is that the lion will kill the animal and and take the first share and then the other retainers will join that is how it works but in this case i think he was too ashamed to kill i mean though he he agreed that okay fine if this camel is so foolish as to to voluntarily offer and so technically you know i am not um, you know technically i am i, I am uh, the, the, i i am i'm free to, i'm it's okay to kill him like like the it's not a technical problem anymore but he knows that spiritually what he's doing is the wrong thing and uh, so he does not in the end kill the kill the camel but but he 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 kind of agrees with with okay and and the other animals are the ones who kill it so the thing is i mean you know is 
it, in, 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 in through these stories, I mean, what, what is going on here is, 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 you know, this is an example of how, you know, the kind of challenges that a king is likely to face, a minister is likely to face. And, and these are like case studies, which, you know, say Vishnu Sharma is putting before the princess. What would you do in this case? What would you do if you were a camel? What would you do if you were the jackal? What would you do if you were the lion? You know, what, whose behavior you think is right, wrong, and how, how is this? And, and the thing is, you are, you know, it allows you to step into every character because the story is being told from all angles. It's, there is no good or evil out here. Everyone's difficulties, everyone's suffering is, is brought before you and I think that is what is so powerful about these stories and that is why I think that you know when I say the the, the Panchatantra communicates its moral through rasa that is what I mean that you know it, um, it it allows you to empathize with these characters to feel their problems and uh, through that now you have to think whether um, you know what is the right thing to do here in, in, in any in the in any if, if, if you were to face with such a challenge in a real circumstance uh, there are I, I actually I had two three more stories to go, but I can see that that only about fifteen minutes are left. So maybe we can have another chat session in the future for that. I'll just add another uh, good quick story since we are talking about migrants here. Another good story about about the problem between hosts and migrants is the bug and the louse story. Uh, so very quickly, that bug and the louse story is where there is a louse and her family. I mean, uh, it's an entire jati, so it, it's something like like a sangharaja, you might say. Uh, you have a, but that's not important here. So you have a louse and a family living in the king's bedchamber. They are, you know, drinking the delicious um, uh, blood of the, the and nutritious blood of the king. Um, and uh, but and then suddenly this buck comes there and and he wants to to sort of enjoy the the, the that delicious food as well. So initially the the louse tells him to get lost, but then you know he comes up with uh, oh you know. Uh, Atiti Devo Bhava and all that, you know, is this how you treat a guest and so on. And this is another example of how, you know, things like Atiti Devo Bhava, or as I initially pointed out, you know, uh, talks about Vairagya and all that. Everything can be used to fool people. Okay, so you have to be very careful about, about how these platitudes are practiced in the world. So he comes up with all these ideas saying that, you know, you know your, your behavior is not proper towards a guest and so on. And then she also feels a bit guilty that, yeah, it's not right. I mean, I'm enjoying all this, this bounty for myself and I should be with share, more sharing and all that. And, and so she allows him to stay. Uh, uh, but, uh, but she says that, look, there are some desha kala niyama. Okay, so there are some rules of the land. And the rules are that uh, you can only bite the king at um, after he's fast asleep, and you should only bite him in the foot, okay? And bite him very gently, okay? He shouldn't feel any pain. And he says, yeah, 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 of course, of course, I'll, I'll do that. No, not a problem. You know, I, I will, I will, um, I will um, uh, follow whatever other traditions of this land, and I have no problems with that. So, uh, what? Uh, but, but then what happens is um, the, that evening that the king comes and lies on bed. And as soon as he has laid down, you know, he, uh, the buck cannot control himself and he bites him very severely on the backside. And the lion and the, the king, of course, gets up, you know, wakes up uh, in pain and, and he calls his guards and there is a inspection of the bed. What, you know, what are these insects doing here? And, and, and the, uh, the bug at that time hides in one of the hollows in the bed while, uh, you know, the, 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 the louse is very slow moving and she and her family get caught and all of them are exterminated. So now, so that's the bug at the louse story. Now, in the, in the first story, we saw that uh, the migrant faced a danger from the host and was killed by the host in the end. Uh, this is a reverse principle. It is showing how the on account of the migrant, the host was wiped out. Now, the reason why I thought, think this story is very interesting is, you know, uh, and the, the moral that the story starts off with is Adnyata Kula Shilasya Na Pradatavyo Ashraya. So you should not give ashray to someone whose Kula and Shila is not known to you, right? One good example we can think of immediately are, say, the Rohingyas. I mean, have we done a proper study of their Kula and Shila? Do we know how these kind of people behave before refuge was given to them and so on? So I mean, that is what the Panchatantra would ask. You know, in, 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 in your in developing your refugee policy, a country, you know, a nation should think of these things. Uh, what, um, 
However, I mean, uh, what this story really reminded me of when I first read it was uh, the Muslim refugee crisis in Europe. I mean, now you know, Europe is you know that that king's bed chamber. I felt was like it's like Europe, right? It's got all these welfare economies. Everybody's having a good time. Everybody's enjoying themselves. And then then you have these refugees saying, "Oh, you know, you know, uh, you, you are enjoying all this by yourself. You know, you should you should part you should." Um, 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 uh, uh, share it with other people, and, and 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 there would be Europeans as well who would be thinking, oh yeah, we we, we should be sharing uh, the goods that we have with other people. And uh, you might, I mean, if I, I would say that the Panchatantra was written in 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 our time, perhaps you know you might even expect say uh, some people, some of the family members of the Laos telling her that you know, oh you know how you know we should be kind to this stranger who has come to us and you know give him ashraya and so on. Uh, and but then of course like uh, yeah, the next thing is, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but the, but what happens next is, is that you know the 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 Laos uh, you know tells him about uh, tells the bug about the Desha Kalaniyama. So that is like these countries saying that okay fine these refugees can settle in, but then they must learn our language, they must follow our customs, they must look at, uh, understand our law, and and you know they they, they must be. Because because any country in any land, I mean, even if it is you know flourishing and prosperous, it happens because there are certain traditions that are flourishing there, and and whoever comes there must adapt themselves to those traditions, and uh, and learn to live that way because only then can you know everybody continue to be prosperous. But and and, and initially, as, as I said, I mean, the bug you know obviously says, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, we I I, I will follow everything. And I, 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 I think the bug was being really sincere. I think he was not saying saying just to sort of you know cheat that louse, and and that's what really makes this all so pathetic. That people do intend to to be good and want to follow all these things, but then what happens is like when the king actually comes to sleep there, the swabhava of the um, or the sheila of the that bug it manifests itself, and then he can't control. So it's not like he wants to. He want to he, see. That's the thing. He 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 didn't want to kill the Laos. The Laos was not his enemy. But the thing is, when you have these kind of contradictions in society, in the end, these kind of problems happen. And that's what the Panchatantra is saying. So similarly, you know, it says Muslim refugees in Europe. I mean, I'm sure they would initially say. I think Tariq Ramadan, for example, I remember has been saying that. Oh, we must follow the law. We must follow the language. We must. We must. You know, we must follow whatever are the customs out there. Out there, you know. Um, but then, in in the end, what happens is just as in case of uh, these bug, uh, this bug that uh, his nature ultimately asserted itself. So, in case of you know, in 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 the human context, you know, it's like the ideology ultimately asserts itself. So, if in the so in case of the Muslim, for example, I think in the end, their religion has asserted itself. I mean, it, it can't. I mean, they may say that oh yeah, it, this is something separate. This is something private. It is it's not some you know we can we can have this and that and so on. But then. Gradually, you see how difficult it is for you know for even with the best intentions. Uh, if you're coming from a certain say, I mean, if you have a certain religion, or it could be your culture, or it could be uh, your personal behavior, or whatever. I mean, there are things which we cannot control, things that drive us, and they will ultimately assert themselves. And these are the sort of issues that hosts must take into account when they give refuge to people uh, in their community. So that's that's uh, another story that that I think is 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 it's a very powerful migrant and host uh, story as well. Okay, so um, I can see that I have about nine more minutes. Uh, if there are any important questions that anyone has to ask, I could answer them, or um, uh, or, or I could go on with another story, which I think is uh, which I like, um, which is the blue jackal story. I mean, I think that's a very famous story. Uh, everyone knows that. Um, uh, I, I won't. Let's say for saving time, I won't. I won't go into the details of the story itself. Uh, I, I just want to to point out the various uh, interpretations that can be made of this this story as to you know why did the jackal ultimately fall? I mean, what, you know, as you know that he 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 was painted blue. He fell into indigo vat and he became blue. Then uh, he became the king and he expelled all his own brethren and and made. Uh, that is the other jackals, and he made the lion and the, the elephant and the tiger and all his ministers. He was embarrassed with his own clan, and he made these uh, these these majestic animals his ministers. 
and uh, but in the end you know the the jackals are howling and he cannot resist it he howls in in response and everyone finds out he's a jackal and then they kill him right so why does he get killed what what is the message here now if you if you look at it from uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, so someone just reading that story in itself might say well uh, the message is probably that deceit does not really work for long you know ultimately your deceit is found out but that is that is not really what the panchatantra is saying okay because because there are other areas where deception is accepted and i think deception is a very complicated topic so i won't go into that in detail it's, i've written about that in the book uh, but but the uh, but deception is not the problem here okay if you look at the prefatory verse the, the the verse that opens up this this story uh it it starts with uh, with the jackal telling the lion that is in the in the first tantra you know the the jackal is really upset that the king has become friends with the bull and he just keeps company with the bull he has um he has um you know uh, ex not expelled but he has he has isolated himself from all the other animals the the, the jackal and so on uh, the other jackals and, and leopards i mean all the other meat eaters so to speak and, and he has he has sort of collaborated he 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 wants the ex he has kept exclusive company with this grass eating bull who he thinks is very enlightened very knowledgeable you know he's a spiritual thing and and the lion also feels like you know yeah i'm a noble person i'm above this jackal and so on and these other other meat eaters you know so my my you know and, and the, the bull is of course a very noble animal he i think is a metaphor for a brahminical ascetic and this king who is a kshatriya you know and, and i think it it kind of um, uh, uh, the kshatriya in the ancient in, in the ancient uh, india was considered as I, I forget the exact word but it was something like uh, uh, rajas uh, um, he, he was predominantly uh, rajasic but subordinately satvik and the bull is 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 a very satvik animal so so because in in the company of the bull the lions satvik quality comes to the fore and, and and he wants to sort of develop that and and stay with the with the bull whereas the 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 jackal is a very rajasic animal he he all he's interested in is more meat and you know uh, greedy and avaricious and calculating and all that stuff so very worldly so so you know obviously the 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 lion thinks he's a bit superior to all these animals that and, and now wants to keep company with the bull so so what the jackal is is and and he makes the bull the prime minister and so on and follows his advice in 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 managing the kingdom and the kingdom comes to a you know it it totters to to its doom as a consequence and so on and so what what the jackal is is trying to get the lion, trying to tell uh, says to the lion is that you know these you know we are the kramagata or the anvayagata bhrutyas you know we have we have been with you through thick and thin and uh, instead of promoting one of us uh, to the pos position of the prime minister you have made this bull your prime minister who's an outsider okay and you are trying to make this outsider into an insider you are trying to make him feel as if you know as you are trying to sort of think that you can he can now be a part of or you can be a part of him or you you too can be like a government or so on and you have made him your insider you have made him part of your in group and you have made us part of the out group and and, and this thing will not work um you know it will lead to your downfall so the, the, the term kramagata anvayagata is very important i mean and, and that just shows like i mean there is just so much to learn from the panchatantra like i mean for example if you look, if you look at dynastic politics in india today i mean i think one of the reason why uh, dynastic politics works i mean why is rahul gandhi still so important i think is because you know people are likely to see him as kramagata or anvayagata that is one who has come down in succession okay this is an important concept in ancient india uh, so uh, so this this is important i mean i mean so uh, i mean if you if you want a modern democracy to work then you know you would have to change these terms like reinterpret say kramagata and vayagata as not just someone who is you know biologically next in line but you know say in case of democracy one who is elected into power is the kramagata like he has come next in in succession so so how do you identify who is next in or because, because kramagata or anvayagata does not necessarily mean biological succession it just means that whoever is properly next in line should succeed and in every age we have to determine this you know how do you decide who succeeds okay so um, the the other way of interpreting kramagata anvayagata here is in terms of uh, 
permanent employees and you know contractors and consultants like if you take this if you read this not in the political context but the economic context then we know that every company has some permanent employees and it has some contractors now permanent employees tend to show you know they are kramagata i mean and that's what um, the jackal is saying like, you know, we are your permanent employees this guy is a newcomer you know how come he's come and you put him over our head this is not right so the it's like the permanent employee saying that look you know we have shown you our our bhakti and and that's another um, uh, another uh, um, uh, debate there you know because the permanent employees they generally have bhakti in the sense that um, you know because they have stayed loyal with to the company for long but the newcomers the contractors they tend to have shakti like you know they can hit the ground running they have upskilled themselves the company doesn't really have to invest in their education and so on but the but the problem is that uh, you know they are likely to be disloyal to the company like if tomorrow something happens to the company they are not going to stay for long they they're just going to move to greener pastures whereas your permanent employees are likely to stick with you through thick and thin but then the problem is that they may not you know be up, be upskilling themselves and so on and so forth so this shakti and bhakti issue has also been discussed in um, in the panchatantra uh, anyway but but uh, it's not very relevant if i just thought i'd i'd mention it and so uh, what he's saying is is that you know you should have give the kramagata anvayagata bhutte the chance so that is one interpretation of this the, of this story uh, another interpretation that you can draw from it is that of the embarrassment that you know a person feels when he rises above his jati so for example in 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 indian history for example we find many cases where let's say you know a shudra a person of a shudra jati may become politically more powerful may become the king and so on and then he becomes embarrassed of other shudra families he starts considering himself a kshatriya he wants to be recognized as a kshatriya he wants to marry into kshatriya families and so on and uh, I, i think that sort of thing has, has happened in in indian history and 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 and, and, the, and the panchatantra uh, this story in particular is warning against that saying that no uh, the, the community in which you are born the community in which you have been raised whose culture and taste and so on you have acquired those are your real brethren i mean those are your real people and in the end if you even try to move away from them uh you know your uh, uh, the, your your affinity for them will ultimately assert itself so uh that's another way of interpreting we see that same kind of behavior let's say with indians uh, you know in the diaspora as well i mean you know uh, in in the beginning when when indians migrate to the west they are likely to you know stay with their with their indian friends and indian neighbors and try and and, and help uh, get their help up with them and so on but then as they become say richer and more powerful and 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 well off then you know they would like to have white friends and stick with you know get more with the white community and so on and they become embarrassed with indians or with india and so on so this kind of behavior also we see and and, and the, the blue jackal is sort of you know i, I think it's a very important story because because it is sort of getting into uh, into uh, all these kind of kind of behaviors so that's um, i think um, uh, so I, i had another story but i think we have we have run out of time here so maybe if if you are interested we can have another session where i could discuss some more stories um uh, my book is is available for sale on amazon.in as well as uh, in on the crosswords portal so if anyone is interested you can you can buy uh, buy that um so yeah i mean that's really what i think i uh, is there for me to cover for today um uh, i'm really as i said, my my gratitude again to indic book club and uh, don't forget to just to tune into indic chat um next sunday at 7 pm uh, because i was you know because i was conducting this session um from um, australia so it is at 11 am uh, indian standard time but uh, next sunday session will be at 7 pm so um uh, uh yeah um Uh, I'll, I'll I'll probably share my my link on my uh, my f- Facebook page. Uh, my Twitter. I, I, let me just uh, perhaps uh, I could just do it here in the comments. Um, for anyone. Um, by the way, if if anyone wants to stick around and have some questions or so on, um, I'm I'm happy to to take them. Uh, I can. Uh, that's not a problem.
Um, okay, so I have, uh, so I just put my link uh, to the book, uh, to my book on Amazon.in. Uh, it, it looks like it's on a 20% discount at the moment. So uh, that's, uh, that's good news. And uh, I, I hope you'll enjoy this, this talk now. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, please put them in the comment section and I could, I'll wait for a, a few minutes to answer them. Otherwise, um, see you next time.